Hey guys, what's up? This is Stephanie. Welcome back to my channel. So in the video today, I'm going to be discussing how my seventh month in a physician assistant residency slash fellowship in critical care medicine was or is. Hopefully this video is helpful for you. For those of you who are wanting to pursue a residency and or fellowship, the name is interchangeable depending what program you're applying to. But whether you're interested in applying to one as a PA once you graduate from PA school or are currently pre-PA student and are considering one, hopefully this video is helpful. So I may be a little bit biased, but I do highly recommend a fellowship slash residency post PA school, especially if it's in specialties like, for example, critical care medicine. Critical care medicine has definitely a huge learning curve, not only for APPs, which includes nurse practitioners and PAs, but also for doctors, especially like some of the residents that I work with, definitely a huge learning curve for all of us. So I think that a residency is very helpful. It will be able to prepare you to treat these type of ill, very, very acute sick patients because you don't get a lot of critical care teaching in PA school. At least I didn't in PA school that I went to. So that's why I decided to apply to a critical care slash residency fellowship for PAs. So let's get into it. So just to give you a little bit of heads up about me, I am currently a physician assistant. I work in critical care medicine and I graduated the year of December 2020. I applied to a critical care medicine, ABP, which stands for advanced practice providers, which included both nurse practitioners and PAs for critical care medicine residency and so I decided to apply to one because I really wanted to do critical care medicine and like I discussed I knew that there was a huge learning curve especially for new graduates and I wanted to make sure that when I started practicing I was very comfortable with doing procedures because you do a lot of procedures as a critical care medicine ABP it includes bronchoscopies, central lines, arterial lines, femoral lines, chest tubes, intubations, etc. I want to be comfortable doing these procedures and then also I wanted to be comfortable trying to treat these patients and treating these patients and saving them and then just be well-rounded. So that's why I decided to do a critical care medicine residency slash fellowship and I have to say that I'm very, very happy that I did because I've learned so much and I've seen a drastic improvement from day one, which was the first day when I entered an ICU, to until now, which is my the end of my seventh month residency. So just to tell you which rotations I've completed. I have to say that I've completed all the required specialty rotations that are required for my residency for a PA. I've completed all of them. So I did my first month in surgical trauma ICU. Most of these patients, like it sounds, are trauma patients. So gunshot wounds to the face, dog bites, any type of orthopedic fractures that are really, really severe, any type of like abdominal, for example, uh, gunshot wounds to the abdominal area, stab wounds, etc. So anything that's trauma. That was my first month. My second month, I did neurotrauma. So these patients are any type of spinal cord injury. We think about the hyperextension and hyperflexion, right? For example, in your car accidents, traumatic brain injuries, any type of blow to the head. That was neurotrauma. And then my third month was neurovascular ICU. So those are going to be your subarachnoid hemorrhages, your subdural, epidural um, bleeds that we learn about in PA school. Um, also, your strokes, you get really familiar during that rotation with neurological exams, how to do a good neuro exam, your GCF scores, your NIH stroke scales, and just how to treat these patients who work alongside neurosurgery. My fourth month was the surgical ICU. We saw a lot of patients, like it sounds, that were post-surgical that were very ill, especially your older patients that have a lot of comorbidities. So we saw a lot of patients that had any type of esophageal surgery or any type of thoracic surgery, whether it was, for example, a VATS procedure, whether it was a ruin y, uh, gastric bypass, any type of esophageal removal, et cetera. And then my fifth month was cardiothoracic ICU. So during that rotation, we saw a lot of patients that were anything cardiac related. So for example, any valve repairs, any patient that had like a mitral valve repair, aortic valve, etc. Patients that were post cabbage, so coronary artery bypass graft patients, patients that had heart transplants or lung transplants. We saw a lot of patients that were on ECMO and we learned about the difference between ECMO and what qualifies a patient to be on ECMO or not, uh, how to troubleshoot ECMO, etc. Definitely one of my favorite rotations thus far. And then my next rotation after that, which was my sixth rotation, was the medical ICU. 
Unfortunately, if you've seen my previous video, that was definitely my by far my worst rotation that I did. Um, but it, I think it was just situational in the time that I did it. A lot of the patients I saw, if not all of them, were COVID patients. So I got really familiar with treating arts. Unfortunately, I would say every day I went, I was signing a death note and pronouncing a patient dead because the thing about COVID is that it just kills patients from all over ages. So we had 20 year olds up to like your 60 year olds and it was just definitely, I hit my lowest point during that rotation. Um, so yeah. And then currently my seventh rotation, which I'm gonna be discussing in this video is gonna be the transplant ICU. So just to tell you how the ICU is. So the transplant ICU is a 10 bed, 12 bed, I apologize, ICU. And the majority of the patients that we take care of, like it sounds, are transplant ICU, transplant patients. So we got a lot of liver donors and then liver recipient patients. So sometimes you would have in the same ICU, the patient that was a donor and the patient that received the liver. We also got a lot of kidney transplant patients there and then a lot of even uh, well, not a lot. They were rare, like pancreas, also transplant patients. Also, any type of bowel transplant, we got those patients. So we got really familiar with just treating these patients that were post-transplant, all the medications that you put them on. They're also, what are what immunosuppressants they're on, what are the mechanism of action of immunosuppressants, why you put renal transplant patients on these immunosuppressives versus liver transplants on these. I got really familiar also with treating just cirrhotic patients because that's the majority of the patients that we saw. If they were waiting for a transplant or if they were just extremely cirrhotic, we saw a lot of cirrhotic patients. I got to do a lot of taps. Um, I got familiar with treating spontaneous bacterial peritonitis on these patients and just treating cirrhotic patients in general. The other type of patient that we saw here were also any type of GI bleeds. So I got familiar with treating GI bleeds. Uh, those were a lot of fun, especially your upper GI bleeds who are actively like hemorrhaging. We would have patients that would be looking like the exorcist, just like throwing up blood everywhere. So this was really interesting on how to manage. So I got really comfortable with treating upper GI bleeds, lower GI bleeds, especially in your active, like hemorrhagic patient when they're actively dying in front of you, how to treat them. I really like that. And during this rotation, also similar to the rotation in the medical ICU that I discussed earlier, uh, this rotation, we would respond to conditions. And this was done in a different hospital. So conditions, you would have your condition C and your condition A. Condition A is usually like a patient that is actively going to cardiac arrest. Um, and then condition C is just going to be any type of critical condition. The thing about these conditions, especially like your condition Cs, it's either a hit or miss. Usually you'll go to the condition C and there's nothing going on with the patient. Like they're perfectly fine. Maybe they just got up and they fell to the side and they felt a little dizzy, but they're fine. You have to learn to triage these patients. Or you can have a patient that's actively into going into cardiac arrest or you arrive to the room, they're fine, and then they go into cardiac arrest. There would be situations where we would go to the room and they're not even connected to monitors. And we would ask the staff, when was the last time the patient was awake? Or does the patient have a pulse? And then they say yes, and we go into the room and the patient has no pulse. And they're like, we have to start like CPR and compressions on these patients. We don't know how long they were down for. Um, so that's what I really like about this rotation is the fact that you're able to go to these conditions and they really teach you how to triage a patient, especially if you don't know anything about them. So you arrive to the condition, you have to ask whoever's taking care of them a one-liner, like what's the patient here for, what past medical history do they have, what medications are they on, et cetera. That way you can kind of form a differential diagnosis and then of course order labs, poke them to the monitor since a lot of these patients are not being monitored. And then the thing about with the COVID-19 pandemic, right, we're short on everything. Nurses, one of the things that we're short on. So some of these nurses have about five patients per nurse. So it's really difficult sometimes just on the nurse to be able to keep track of everything. Um, so that was definitely very, very hard, especially when we came with these patients that were like actively dying or were going into cardiac arrest. But like I said, I really learned how to actively triage this patient. If the patient is hypoxic, is definitely deciding in front of you. You have to go in there and intubate them. Um, I had a patient that was hypoxic and she was post-surgery. And then of course, one of the things that she had an abdominal surgery. So one of the things we want to rule out is abdominal compartment syndrome, right? Um, and we had to intubate her. But for example, if your patient that 
if you come into a room and a patient's hypoxic, you have to go through your differentials. Are they like, septic? Are, are they having a PE, right? And you have to go through all your differential diagnosis. So of course you're gonna get chest sex where you're gonna get a CPC, a BMP, a lactate also. Um, it just depends how the patient presents. There was one patient that we came in, she had altered mental status and right when we got into the room, she's, she went to cardiac arrest. We did CPR for about five minutes, we brought her back and then we tried to intubate her and then she like clenched down and then just uh, died unfortunately. And then we started doing CPR again. We did CPR for 40 minutes and the entire time we couldn't place a tube down her throat or try to intubate her because she was just clenching down. Um, then of course, been, there would have been, we could have done different things during that scenario, but sometimes when you're in that scenario, it's really hard to think. And then what I notice about when you go to these conditions is that everyone's just very scared. So they just kind of watch you. And sometimes you have to remind them like, you have to give them assignments like you do this you do that you go get the epi like you start getting the labs you start putting the ivs and someone needs to be in the room ensuring that they assign roles to everyone so this condition runs smoothly and then especially with cpr with compressions i mean during that month giving cpr is very very exhausting especially i think i'll be honest with you i'll probably last two minutes giving cpr and then i'm running out of breath and the thing about cpr is that you want to make sure that you're giving Good compressions and studies have shown that the quality of compressions that you're giving for a patient is really important on saving the patient's lives. So if you're not giving good compressions, and then maybe that's when it's someone else's turn. So that was one of the things that I learned that compressions are just very, very uh, exhausting. So I would, sometimes I would only get about two minutes, and especially if the patients. There were some conditions that we went to where the patient's actively throwing up, and if you're the type of person who can't stand smells like I do. Sometimes in those situations, I would try to back away, but of course help my colleagues, especially the nurses who are just doing compressions, especially if you're a patient that you're doing compressions for 40 minutes, it's very, very exhausting. And so um, that was very interesting. That's definitely one of the things that I liked about that rotation. I learned a lot about how to run conditions and just codes in general. And then I also learned a lot of what not to do during codes and conditions. So I really liked that rotation. I think that's one of my favorite rotations also. Um, uh, the transplant ICU just because of the acuity of patients that you see. So a lot of these cirrhotic, cirrhotic patients are ticking Tom bombs, especially if they have any type of esophageal or varices. They just start, can blow up anytime, anytime soon. So I really like this rotation and I finished all my core rotations. So my next rotation is going to be surgical trauma ICU. So I'm going to go back to where I rotated my first month. We'll see how it is. It's, the second time around because the first time when I rotated, I knew nothing about the surgical trauma. So I definitely struggled with that rotation. But being now that I'm seven months in, I know what I know. I feel a lot more comfortable than how I did the first month. We'll see how it goes. So I will definitely give you an update. So just in general, in my seven months that I've done, I'm very grateful for having completed a residency slash fellowship because I've learned so much and I've learned, I feel more comfortable with intubation procedures I feel more comfortable on lining a patient that's crashing. I would have never been able to do that my first month. A patient that's actively crashing, being able to actively place a line correctly on my first try, whether it's a central line, whether it's an arterial line, being able to intubate the patient, not only being able to intubate the patient, but being able to choose the medications and the doses appropriately for the patient you're gonna be intubating. So I hope this video was helpful for you. I am halfway through my residency, if not, almost done, so close to being done. So I'm very, very excited for when I finish my residency. I do have to say that I'm exhausted and I can't wait to go back to work in a while. All right guys, thanks for watching my video and I'll talk to you guys later, bye.